Well, praise the Lord. It is so good to be with you again in this community Bible church church service, our Sunday morning service. And I'm, I'm very thankful that you have joined us. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to be with us and to minister to our hearts this morning. Dear Lord, Lord, I'm thankful for you. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would guide us and help us and minister to us. Give us your help and your touch. Lord, we need your anointing more than anything else in the world. And we're believing you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing a couple of songs here. Uh, the first one, God leads us along in shady green pastures so enchant so sweet God leads his dear children along where the waters cool flow bathes the weary ones feet God leads his dear children Through the blood, some through great sorrow. 
us along and he's the one that does the leading praise the lord and i am so glad and so thankful that he does that the second song surely goodness and mercy and i'd like to to give a big thank you to randall kindle he is the one that taught me this song taught me the verses to it i knew the chorus but taught me the verses and so i'm going to do my best here Thanks so much, Randall. What a wonderful song this is. A pilgrim was I and a wandering In the cold night of sin I did Jesus, the kind shepherd the Lord. Hallelujah. My sermon this morning, the Lord's instructional prayer. The Lord's instructional prayer. It's the Lord's prayer. What a precious, precious prayer. A precious passage of scripture. It's Matthew 6, 9 through 13. But would you say it with me? 
Jesus said, After this manner, therefore pray ye. Let's say it together. Would you say it with me? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a precious, precious passage of Scripture. I know that this is a prayer, but let's pray that the Lord would help us in this sermon this morning. Dear Lord, Lord, we need you. Lord, give your touch and your help, I pray. Lord, as I preach this sermon, let the words of my mouth be your words. Oh, Lord, I want my heart to be submitted to you. Lord, guide and help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, the four verses previous to this prayer are very important because they lay the foundation for this model prayer that the Lord gives his disciples. So, Matthew 6, 5 and 6, uh, prayer is personal. I'm going to read the Randy's translation of that. Matthew 6, 5 and 6, Whenever you should find yourself praying... You will not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray while standing in the synagogues and at the corners of wide streets, so that they might be observed by people. I am telling you the truth. They are receiving their reward in full. So whenever you yourself would pray... Enter into a room where you can have privacy, and shutting the door, pray to your Father from the hidden place. Your Father who is looking into the hidden place will pay you back publicly. So, this intro to this model prayer is telling us don't pray to be seen or admired. Pray in such a way that God is the only one who is honored and glorified. Verses 7 and 8. Prayer is an exercise of faith in God's love and provision. Matthew 6, 7 and 8. Again, Randy's translation. As you are praying, do not babble repetitively in accordance with the heathen practices. For they suppose that with many words their petition will be heard. So then do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Hallelujah. You see, prayer doesn't make God do anything. God already knows the need. And he loves you so much that he will take care of any need that you may have. So here are some thoughts about the Lord's instructional prayer. Matthew 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, this is the very first petition that is given to us. Let your name be reverenced as holy. The first petition. 
let your name be reverenced as holy or hallowed be thy name. So point number one, God is perfect, holy, and just. This is more than an earthly father who sometimes makes mistakes and doesn't do everything right. This is the heavenly father who does do everything right. Hallowed be thy name. Let your name be reverenced as holy. God's name is indicative of his character. Here's the great passage on God's name, on his character. Whenever Moses went up into the mount, God put him in the cave, covered him with his hand. Exodus 34, verses 5, 6, and 7. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. God's name, indicative of his character. If God is who he claims to be, then God cannot do anything bad or inappropriate. I know that seems simple, but everything God does is good. We may not or cannot understand his goodness, but we have to trust him. All that God has done is reflective of his absolute perfection. With God, nothing is arbitrary, capricious, or spontaneous. Everything has to be done exactly as it's done from what God does. Now, God made humanity with a free will. That's his creation. He created them with a free will. But think about this. If God is absolutely perfect, if he cannot do anything bad, if everything that he does is right and good, can God do anything he wants to do? God's absolute perfection seems to be deterministic for him. It determines already what God can and cannot do. I mean, we don't think of God like that. But I know it's true. God cannot do anything bad. He can't do anything that is wrong. Everything God does is right and good. God must always do the right and the best thing. So, for the Father in heaven, his name must be reverenced as holy. God is the foundation for all that is good and he is the absolute source for all that is holy. Number two, the first part, first three words of verse 10 is the second petition. Thy kingdom come. So point number two, his coming kingdom is the dominant kingdom. God's plan has always been to provide the best for his creation. God adopts us as his own 
children. He wants to use us in his kingdom when God rules the world in the perfect way that no human could ever achieve. I mean, we are under human governments. Some are good. Some are better than others. Some are just not good at all, but they're human governments. I've imagined myself in a place of leadership, and I'll promise you there is no way that I could do any better than the worst leader. But when God rules, oh, that's the hope, the promise that we have. For once, for the very first time, everything will be done right. And God's kingdom will be a family-run business. You see, God adopts us as his own sons and daughters. And God is going to put his children in places of prime leadership whenever he rules the world. Again, when God's kingdom comes, everything will be done right. Thy kingdom come. And then the second part of verse 10 is the third point, the third petition. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God's will. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The third point is God's will is inarguable and absolute. So this third petition of our Lord's Prayer is not mystical as much as it is a deliberate, rational act of our own will. I know the petition is, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, in my, Whenever I was translating it, I translated it, Let your will happen, as in heaven also on earth. But this is resting with us. We have to acknowledge God's will in asking that God's desires and design be accomplished instead of our own. In praying this prayer, we are giving up our own rights to decide for ourselves. And as was stated previously, God has given humanity a free will so that they can choose for themselves. They can choose God's will and trust Him implicitly that He is loving and good and that He will never do anything anything or allow anything that will be to our ultimate detriment? Or, as humanity often does, one can choose to exercise that free will for themselves, and one may follow his or her own sense of what is best or convenient. Don't want God to tell me what to do. I'll decide what's best for me. And oftentimes that is the attitude. If a person trusts in the love of God, that person will know of a surety that choosing God's will over one's own will is the only safe and reasonable choice. Choosing God's will over your own will does indeed mean giving up your right to choose for yourself and letting God choose for you. Obviously, this cuts across the grain of our ingrained human nature. This is not an easy choice. The end always comes out right when you opt for God's will over your own. If there is a heaven, and I firmly and vehemently believe that there is, if there is a heaven, then God's will is the only true choice. Choosing God's will over your own is bringing heaven's accomplishments to earth. Thy will be done in earth as 
as it's already happening in heaven. Number four, the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. So point number four, God is the supplier and the provider. We have prayed in this prayer already for God's name to be respected and reverenced as holy. We have prayed for His will, I'm sorry, for His kingdom to come and be established on the earth. We have prayed for God's will to take priority and precedence over our own. And now the Lord's Prayer seems to follow the next logical step. God, let us trust you to take care of all of our physical needs. This petition makes receiving the bread we need for today God's responsibility. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? It's not our responsibility. God willingly takes the responsibility to make sure that our food needs, our, our lodging needs, our shelter needs are all met today. It also lets God do what needs to be done His way instead of our own. We don't have to figure out how the need will be met. We just have to trust God to do it for us. I know Benjamin Franklin wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac that God helps those who help themselves. And some people even think that that's in the Bible, but it's not at all. It's not that God helps those who help themselves most of the time, God helps those who have no recourse, who absolutely cannot help themselves. And when we come to the place where we're dependent entirely on God, that's the time that God always comes through for us. Number five, the fifth petition, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So point number five is sin is a big deal as long as we are in our humanity. We all have a debt of sin that has to be paid. And the credit side of the ledger just seems to keep growing. We get farther and farther into debt with our sins. Jesus died to forgive you of your sins by his grace. His forgiveness is a free gift that costs you and me absolutely nothing. Hallelujah! It is honestly and truly free. All you have to do is ask for and accept that forgiveness. God the Father forgives your sins because His Son paid for all sins by His death on the cross. What is free to you cost God the Father everything. His own, only begotten Son If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I wouldn't try to make anybody get saved. But I, I really want you to know that God loves you dearly and He wants you to be in His family. He wants to adopt you. God wants to forgive you of your sins. It's not God's will that anyone perish. It is God's will that all come to repentance. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you do that? I have a challenge for you. Pray and ask God, Lord, 
I'm not living for you right now. But would you show me yourself in such a way that I can believe in you and not doubt you? I challenge you, if you'll ask God to do that for you, he will do it. It will be amazing to you what God will do for you. I, he's real. If you truly understand what forgiveness is, then you must forgive those who have incurred debts of trespass against you. If the forgiveness of God is real to you, then you must also offer the same gift of forgiveness to others. Number six. The last petition. God is our deliverer. Here's the petition. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, the implication here is not that God will push people into temptation unless they specifically ask him not to. The idea here is asking God to make sure that when temptation happens as you follow God, and it will, it's not that God is leading you into temptation. It's part of life. But when that temptation happens as you're following God, pray that God will give you deliverance from the pressure and the enticement of the devil and his demons. And God will do it for you. He will do it for you. Number seven, point number seven, it's not a petition, it's the doxology. The, the seventh point is God is the one who gets all the glory. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, you may leave that part off, and there are many that, that leave that doxology off the prayer when they pray the Lord's Prayer. And, and this doxology is contested as to whether or not it was actually said by Jesus as he was giving it. And manuscript evidence gives credence to the fact that it may not have been said. And yet, these also may be the words of Jesus. There is manuscript evidence in favor of it. To me, the doxology to this prayer does not take anything away from the scriptures, but instead it fits very well into how our Lord would have given all the glory and the honor to his Father. And in that sense, it is important that we all make sure that God is the one who gets the glory for everything. It's not about us. It's not about our grand ideas. It's not about us feeling sorry for ourselves and the sympathy, and the sympathy we think we deserve. Everything is about God. To Him belongs the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Prayer, in conclusion, prayer is all about us yielding our will to God's will. He knows what's best. God will always do what's best. And may God be glorified, honored, and uplifted as your prayers are answered. And again, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, Will you call out to him in faith right now? He really is waiting to hear from you. Let's pray, dear Lord. Lord, I'm so thankful for these instructions that you gave us on how to pray. Touch our hearts. Help us, Lord, to approach you with confidence and know that you want 
to meet every need. Lord, that one that doesn't know you, Lord, give them the boldness. Give them the confidence, the faith, oh God, to come to you and believe you that you are indeed who you claim to be. Lord, go with each one of us. Help us, Lord, to pray and believe for the answer. Lord, you're going to meet every need. Go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you.